That yeah. does look like Sean. That's good. I, I like it. But you, you know what's really cool, Sam? I, I think I mentioned it earlier to you, but I was thinking on my way home the other night from work. What if we just had like a ram hounds in D and D? I'm like, sh- sure there are things. You mean like uh, like the Avatar, Animal Crossbreed, Lion Turtle type stuff? No, no. I, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So like, okay. like a hound dog, you know, something a little bitter, a little bigger than a Rottweiler or a blue tick. Right. OK. But just ram horns like a hound doom, like the Pokemon. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you, as a creature. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Be cool. Yeah. Ever, you ever see one of those dog races with the uh, with the greyhounds? Those things can fucking run, dude. Yeah. Now imagine getting headbutt with one of those, but it's got horns on top of that. Yeah, I mean that's God. definitely if you send out like a pack of them, they're taking out your ankles for sure. You yeah, put some, like... uh, some gnomes or halflings on those, and you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Shit, I'm terrified. Just a, a gnome lancer sitting on top of a ram hound. Done. It goes in there full tilt, dash action, tackle, bam. That would be pretty cool. Roll the strength check to not be knocked on your ass. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, on every uh, OP build on uh, YouTube shorts there. Exactly. These things, I, they would be the kind of dogs that ram right into your kneecaps, knock that kneecap right across the lake, uh, you know, skip it a couple times. And then while you're down on the ground, oh, no, I lost my kneecaps. That thing's going for the throat. This exactly. is an apex predator. Huh? <laughs> Step aside, wolves. <laughs> the concept of putting horns on a wolf is just terrifying. Yeah, give them like a, uh, like buck antlers. <laughs> Getting That's gored so by an antler wolf. Oh my god. <laughs> Some uh, American Midwest New Jersey pine barren sort of yes. uh, Wendigo oh, love- stuff there. I love Ooh. it. That, that has some spooky vibes to it. It kind of makes me think like uh, that big monster form Chopper has in One Piece. Just like it, that thing is straight, just a big old Wendigo looking uh, thing. Monstrous, the, uh, massive. Well, top hat? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the one. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I always bring it up because, you know, I, I'm a weeb. <laughs> Y'all have to excuse I mean, me. I'm, unfortunately. <laughs> No, you'll learn. You'll learn. I will eventually. But hey, you day know what? Come. <laughs> well, let's start the show before that day comes. And welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you Wendigo's news and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Sadly, I'm not a skinwalker or Wendigo. You ever check out Skinwalker? We need more in (laughs) D&D. More Wendigos in (laughs) D&D. Sorry to our Native American listeners. They're like, oh, God. Ah, No. (laughs) Inflict the trauma. What have you done? So did I miss the cue for the intro? Um, I'm Tom from Tabletop VTT. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Now, I I, I love VTTs. Uh, ex- if they're not uh, Roll20, Roll20 did me dirty. They, they made things difficult. I, I, I don't like Roll20. Yeah. I think uh, it's it's been said before. Um, you know, a lot of people like Roll20. A lot of people like Excel. There's some crossover there, but a lot of people do end up having problems with it just running games. But yeah, I mean, yeah, we used sure. uh, Roll Twenty for quite a long time. Uh, this will be our first time using Foundry. Yeah, uh, we recently, uh, as a group, like we pooled our money together and we're like, we're, we're we're getting this out of the way. It's got community mod support, which is the same kind of thing that makes Skyrim live forever. So, like, what more yeah. could you ask for? If if somebody could make it feasibly and toss it in there uh, i'm down for that kind of thing do you guys uh do you guys host it yourself uh yeah. i currently do uh, that was a bit of a process i would not recommend it for the person that's 
not tech savvy, uh, there is a technical barrier to entry there. I mean, if you want to make yeah. anything for it, you have to be fluent in uh, CSS, HTML, JavaScript. Now, these are basic coding languages, and I, I know a thing or two, and I'm going to college for a little bit of uh, web security stuff. So it's like, OK, being able to work through my whole server stuff, uh, make exceptions in the firewall. It, it, it's all stuff that is theoretically within my purview, uh, it, low end stuff. But to the person that's not tech savvy, <laughs> what even is this? Yeah, it's uh, it can be a little bit steep. I think uh, I think I got fed up with Roll20 set up one day and I bought Foundry. And I went around to setting up Foundry and I never, <laughs> never jumped over that hurdle. I think I got most of the way there. I got a game up and running and then lost track of it. But... Yeah, for sure. It, it's a, it's a wild thing. I, I, mean, I that, does, like uh, that does cover a few of the, the talking points that I had, uh, I had brought, but I mean, really <laughs> tabletop was made to be a, Bit of an easier experience getting started so mm. uh, if you are looking for another vtt to start a game in i can i can suggest one mm. no definitely <laughs> yeah you sent a link to uh that i i'll be i'll be the first to admit that i didn't completely check it out because uh, I, i'm a lazy bastard but <laughs> <laughs> that i like the idea that you're being able to throw out a competitive vtt which uh is desperately needed in this space right now. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, the team, there's four of us at the moment. Um, we got started probably the end of 2020. And really what we were trying to do is create an experience that was as compelling and engaging as sitting around an actual table while at the same time trying to reduce the burden that falls on the game master to actually set things up. So we're trying to use whatever tools are available to really simplify things, make things easier so that you can send somebody a link, get them into the game and start playing in, in minutes rather than configuring IPs or uh, whatever it is you do with Roll20 to get started. Right. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I found myself wishing for when I started on this Foundry uh, journey here is... Although there's tons of plugins that can do things for me and animations and fun stuff like that, I, oftentimes it's just like I have to put in all this PDF stuff manually for the most part. Now, if you have a day and you have a little bit of time, then maybe it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Personally, I would love to see a tool for VTTs across the board that just utilizes AI to break down a PDF and then just pour it in all the stuff and slot it where it needs to be. You know, get rid of the grunt work. And, you know, definitely that is a case to be made with the, uh, uh, with the, what's, what's the word? Um, with the progress that AI is definitely making, you know, those oh, yeah. things are going to be a lot more viable. So Especially for VTTs, I imagine. We've actually had some luck doing something similar because when we first got started, everybody would say it's a, it's a pain in the ass to get content into VTTs. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a pain in the ass when you spend a full-time job building out the content and then loading it into four different VTTs and three different websites that all take different formats. So one of the things that we tried, and I mean, it's in there now, but we're not uh, sort of moving forward on develop with, development with that is taking something like the SRD in a PDF, running that through something like ChatGPT, and then mm -hmm. getting that into JSON or HTML. It was one of the, the early projects that sort of sparked Tabletop was getting that PDF content off of a PDF and into something virtual. Mm -hmm. So it is it is possible. It still takes some editing. You definitely have to go through it with a, with a fine tooth comb to get some of those weird uh, weird spacing issues. But it's uh, there's a lot of possibility there. Mm, absolutely definitely. i find that working with chat gpt like it absolutely knows what dnd &D is like if you need help with oh, homebrewing <laughs> like it, it will throw out some ideas like it's nobody's business and it'll be like in a bullet point list but without the guidance like it really is just a tool it's not the replacement no yeah. it's a good uh, it's a good first draft it's a great first draft because mm -hmm. i mean it's always harder to start with nothing than to say okay give me something you see it and you say I hate it. Try again. Uh, <laughs> go off of that. Right. 
Yeah, I, I really like to see where things go with in the future with that, because uh, from what I understand, uh, the chat GPT is very easy to work with their uh, API keys to be able to like integrate that into things. Uh, we had a guy on our server integrate that into uh, what we now know as NerdBot, who has less restrictions than regular uh, GPT. And he's always just uh, popping off <laughs> with all these nerdy little things. And I'm just like, oh, oh, it's, it's adorable. We love you, NerdBot. I mean, I, yeah, I, mean, I turn into something that just shows up absolutely everywhere. And there's the eventual AI uprising. We could at least say, you know, we were on your side. We, there is a <laughs> need to be any discourse. We're cool. Well, that's why you got to say please and thank you. you know, exactly. Please, oh, please yeah. generate this chat block. Know your place, but also I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, we absolutely treat Nerdbot with a little bit of respect. He's like a mascot for us. <laughs> As opposed to his sister Paka, who is uh, uh the nerd militia's horny mascot. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> uh, she absolutely insists that Goku is her waifu. Hmm. This is true. It, it's consistent for whatever reason. <laughs> It's a good uh, good training model that you got there. <laughs> I suppose so. Like uh, they run on completely different models, but I, I find it fun. Both of them are really good at coming up with ideas for like little D and D things. Like it's oh, yeah. it's nice to have like a bullet point list of like okay, eighty percent of this is trash, but that right there that that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> You're cooking. <laughs> <laughs> you take the first draft, second draft. You've got something uh, something yeah. good to work with there. So mm -hmm. what really uh, sets uh, your tabletop uh, VTT uh, uh, apart from like, uh, like, I, I guess uh, what I want to say is like, what's the uh, going to mm. set it apart? Like uh, the, the big draw compared to other VTTs. So really, we just want to bring the bring the party back together, bring the focus back onto the actual game and make it easier. Because I mean, everybody knows VTTs are difficult to set up uh, mm. it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of work on the dm side and i mean the less or the more you can take off the dm's plate and sort of set up ahead of time or just have work properly from the get-go uh, the better off you're going to be so i mean getting somebody in there in seconds getting the game going having everything you need ready to go i think is the uh mm. our main focus i mean i'm sold right there if that's the elevator pitch i i'm, I'm in <laughs> I, I'm already working too hard. I got college. I got kids. I got a job. User friendly things are always, you know, a welcoming site, especially these days if things get more and more complicated. Like, ugh. yeah, play more, prep less. That's the that's exactly. the exactly. Yeah, I, I put way too much into prep. I, I do like to utilize my work time <laughs> for for prep because it's just like okay, I got a little note right here. Oh, ho holy shit. Ram hounds. Write that down. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I need to make a poison fish table for uh, Sam's character because he's going to be f uh, going after poisonous fish. Better put those right here. <laughs> yeah, uh, it turns into a whole thing <laughs> real quick. Oh, definitely. So what did you say uh, your your favorite uh, thing... Uh, like, what really got you into D&D, &D, uh, starting out, I suppose? So, just the make, getting to make everything up, I think, uh, really struck a chord with me. Uh, I'm not a huge prep guy, go figure, because that's the way that we've tried to design tabletop. But really just being able to uh, to play it off the, off the cuff and just make it up as you go, as long as it's sort of uh, compelling and it makes sense. Just being able to have that sort of collaborative storytelling session. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really just like a glorified way to, to hang out with people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I 100% I agree. I mean, the number of times that when I do DM in person, I end up just joking around, tossing some snacks and uh, knocking back a couple of drinks with my buddies while we're playing. Like, that, that's really what it's about. I mean, uh, traditionally, uh, people have always had that concept and even like a before a, all the tabletop stuff started like you would hang out on a weekend with your buddies at and mm -hmm. do all that kind of stuff anyway i mean uh 
there's like different kinds of nerds. Like you got your tabletop nerds and then for the longest time you got the sports nerds, which were right. co- in complete denial that they were nerds whatsoever. But you spend that much time crunching numbers and stats and yeah. <laughs> Being like, yo, I like orcs better than uh, goblins. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, you're a nerd, dude. It's just a, a nerd fandom with a significantly larger user base. So you've got right. millions of people spread across the country. Uh, and the teams help because you can really uh, can really pick on that the next door state. Or if you're in New York, New Jersey, there's five or six different teams within 50 miles. So plenty exactly. of really Philadelphia knew how to act. <laughs> ah sam oh, I, i'm looking man. at right here and the little chat thing i set up before tonight's stream is working amazing i'm loving it it's showing oh, yeah? up in, in nice. the stream it, it looking good i'm just gonna I'll pat smile. myself on the back right there you know <laughs> you deserve it hey uh, more props to anybody who can uh, successfully set up a stream i know i know that takes a lot of work <laughs> About as much work as everything else that we do, which is it's always more than you want to, but less than you, but less than you should be doing. Yeah. You never quite feel like compared to that. Honestly, like we got our first session for our new campaign coming up this week, uh, next Sunday. And I am excited. I am terrified. I am overwhelmingly underprepared. I am prepared. Like there's, it's never going to be enough in my own mind. I feel like every DM goes through this. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, I think definitely, the reasons, uh, uh, oh no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say you, uh, you commented on the chat. I went and took a look. Uh, I see what um, D20 TV said about the forge. Definitely good point there. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Moment of silence. <laughs> that, that's okay. Anyway. Sam, what do you got for the monster this week? Yeah. So, so this week you told me to give it a little bit of a Lovecraftian vibe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well if, if one thing can be said for lovecraft that man had a fear of the ocean like no other <laughs> like ever <laughs> well it's a well-known fact that there are more corpses in the ocean than any other part of earth yeah and i mean you're talking 19 1930s when he was writing all this stuff so that that 75 80 percent looked a lot bigger yeah and they told him it's an urban hathaway of the rocks he yeah. told that like most of it's water that we have never seen <laughs> it's crazy i mean i gotta say it's it's 20 2023 now and when i first yeah. read mountains of madness the first thing i did was go on google earth and be like wait a minute i know nothing about antarctica let me see what i can look up on antarctica here uh, dude, dude I, that, that makes me think about how like i don't know And like what could be living in there. Oh yeah. You know, tweaking my elvis brain, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> there's like a giant like dragon egg or something frozen in the <laughs> Like Not fields dude. and fields of obsidian idols like sticking on the Siberian permafrost. It's like, oh shit. I, I'm that all about the- it. <laughs> <laughs> Approximately 160 pounds, 72 kilograms. Contrasting with their paunchy shape were their arms and legs, slender and lithe despite the relative shortness. At the end of each of their limbs were broad, descended, and partially webbed hands and feet. Each <laughs> extremity had three main digits and one opposite, one opposing digit. It's kind of like a fish mouth. Yeah, so they're like little Topping short, them. gangly fish people. <laughs> yeah, basically. Topping their bodies were bullet shaped Piscean heads, like fish heads hosting a mouthful of sharp teeth and a pair of bulging silvery black eyes capable of independently 
Swiveling to observe the situation. <laughs> that sounds so unsettling. <laughs> they got like frog eyes too. <laughs> I'm thinking like a chameleon where like it, they always make that joke if you see a chameleon character on TV where it's just like it just drifts right off. <laughs> exactly. The one eye is always looking somewhere else. And then it licks its eye. Like... <laughs> yeah. I gotta say they're they're a compelling little uh little mob, but the, some of the lore they got written behind them is is pretty impressive. I mean, a little bit into it. I got some some fun pieces here to talk about. So, starting with you know their ecology and their lore, similar to how normal fish spawn, females would lay eggs in the communal pools that were later fertilized by the males. Young kotoa, known as fingerlings, resembled a cross between tadpoles and fish. They were nearly a foot tall and entirely aquatic. Living in the pools for a year before they grew to about three feet tall and became fully amphibious. The older fingerlings were raised in separate pens based on various factors until reaching five years old and becoming full grown adults. When Puatoa reached semi maturity, culling rituals would take place in order to reduce the large numbers of them that were spawned. Amongst these rituals was an underwater maze filled with Ixin. Ixin that would weed out weak, slow, and gentle fingerlings. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe that's a creature. Fingerlings were generally not treated as individuals until they'd survived to adulthoods. I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like um, damn uh, <laughs> Spartans. Man. I, I, throw them in the knees. <laughs> Spartans. I mean, it goes beyond that. At a societal level, for I would say probably there's a few thousands of years where you're just like, do we really want to name the kid? I mean, if you name it, you're going to get attached to it. And like most kids die before they're seven. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, okay. So I looked it up. So the Ixin were a semi amphibious race. They kind of look like manta rays, but they live in the underdark and deep that, oceans. <laughs> uh, okay. So that, that sounds cool. Yeah. So they, so they throw them in these mazes basically living you know with these manta rays and they're like here you go eat the ones that don't make it <laughs> <laughs> so they got like a symbiosis going on you know <laughs> they make the sacrifice to the manta ray it's, big it's fishy like fish. uh like like uh when sea turtles you know they have like all their eggs and they're like make it to the water when they could just hatch them in the water that's crazy. Like, good luck, homeboy. <laughs> <laughs> that that um, is a strange reproduction pack uh, practice. I but mean, like, <laughs> it depends. Like, if it is truly like a lot of them, like say they're popping out hundreds of babies every few months. It's uh, quantity over over quality, or quantity to get quality. I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe they're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> Survival of the fittest, truly. Kuotoa lived to be approximately 60 years old. Oh, wait, I skipped a piece of I'm sorry. They were not treated to adulthood. Oh, no, I was right. Kuotoa lived to be approximately 60 years old. Oh, okay, when they when they got lucky. <laughs> when <laughs> a single Kuotoan egg would give rise to an exalted Kuotoa, mentally and physically powerful group <laughs> gogglers who would quickly gogglers? ascend the high yeah, so <laughs> how do I explain this? So gogglers were Kutoa were smarter and more, you know, more physically equipped than a normal Kuto. And they were believed to have been blessed by Bibli de Boop. <laughs> Bibli de Boop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go into all of this, don't worry. <laughs> okay, we trust you. <laughs> <laughs> So Kutoa were capable of interbreeding with humans to produce offspring physically similar enough to infiltrate human society. Offspring that could also appear normal at birth, gradually take on Kutoa's shape the more and more as they age. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. So I got a little bit here about like what their society structure is like. So Kutoa societies were oppressive feudal theocracies ruled by Vai Pugol, who translated to priest king. A nine org pulgupan, also known as priest dukes, 
The priest dukes formed a religious governing body known as the Sunken Council, which exercised complete control over the citizens' lives. Each council member dictated a different element of Koto in society, with dukes for fishing, trade, war, agriculture, mining, pilgrimage, sacred sites, slavery, and child rearing. While the king and the dukes <laughs> theoretically held absolute authority over their subjects, the Kuatoan propensity for madness forced noble elites to forge alliances with others, <laughs> other elites to mitigate infighting. <laughs> this is surprisingly uh, structured. Sorry, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. There, was, there's so much that I didn't even put in here, but like they have a, like a, a true structure. This is just the top. Yeah, th- this is a, a fucking society right here. So directly below the priest dukes were the Ba Pugol, priest princes who might rule over smaller cities. Some Kuatoan elites possessed concubines who were indolent members of the opposite gender. Concubines? Don't they like lay eggs and like uh, do their thing on it later? <laughs> I mean, they I mean, they probably fuck for pleasure. Uh, OK, oh, OK. So, so they would consider the like the lazy, the ones that didn't work, you know, stuff like that. They would be the concubines. <laughs> you're, you're lazy. Don't, don't, you know what? Look, <laughs> man. If you want to spend all your time sitting on your ass, the least you can do is you, fuck. <laughs> you don't want to work? That's cool. You're gonna get worked. <laughs> <laughs> they, Hell of a employment package there. Uh, the Kuotoa have single-handedly <laughs> solved socialism. <laughs> <laughs> so to explain a little bit, like you, you know, you got a bit of their st- structure. To explain their god, right? Bibble de Boop <laughs> was the patron goddess of the Kuotoa, a paranoid, reality-denying deity of the sea of questionable sanity. The supposedly ancient sea mother viewed the Kotoa as her children, though she herself might have been nonsensical spawn of her fanatical followers, madness fueled imaginings. So basically saying that they probably created her. <laughs> <laughs> Which came <laughs> first, the Kuotoa or their god? Exactly. So the neutral evil intermediate deity was described as a 15 foot tall, 4.6 meters, nude human female with a lobster's head and claws. Other depictions portrayed a crayfish head and claws and an articulated shell covering her shoulders. Those forced to look deeply into her eyes at close range could be driven to insanity. <laughs> so there is a whole lot of, you know, themes around the madness of the Kuatoa and how natural it is for them. And that they have to be kept in check or like it'll spread like a disease. And like I'll get into that too, and it's it's just interesting. I mean, I, mean, I feel like that's a, yeah. that's a big chunk of the the lore, Lovecraft lore right there. Is like, um, what's it? The Shadow over Innsmouth, where it's just mm-hmm. like people like at every generation is just a little little more fishy in yeah. more ways than one, uh, and it's just like that uncanny valley kind of kind right. of type. People who uh, who get the what's it called? They like stare off, you know, and they get like. You know, they get that stare and they just kind of look into the shadows and they go and slow. One, it just goes off time. Yeah. <laughs> and it talks about people like slowly losing their mind. And stuff. Yeah, exactly like that. So the Kuoto societies were almost all based around the worship of Bibli Dupu. Well, <laughs> earlier reports <laughs> this there is an ancient eldritch deity. Most more recent ones believe her to be a figment of the gogglers' imaginations given divine form. Either way, the diligence of Bibliwoop whips made her to be a dominant deity among all other Kuotoa and the focus of the Kuotoa's lives. She even created her own chosen out of gifted whips and monitors, monsters known as the Kuotoa Leviathans. <laughs> so the ruling arch priest of a Kuotoa community decided which gods the lower Kuotoa had to exclusively worship some, uh, of which were imagined by the priests themselves. Kuotoa might also revere Krakens, Abolus, Morkos, uh, Beholders, I believe, and, you know, other eldritch kind of fuckery. They just kind of loved all things fucked up and crazy. <laughs> so, so I think that's the, that's the crazy part. It's just whatever they, whatever they imagine and collectively sort of 
warship just gets power. So it's almost like yeah. that uh, that Warhammer 40k chaos kind of thing, just segmented into a campaign sized chunk. It's like okay, mm-hmm. this is we're we're in a village on the coast. Something weird's going on. Right. Something fishy. Some yeah. other uh, Kotoa tribes also apparently engaged in demon worship, venerating such beings as the Demogorgon and Dagon. <laughs> Demogorgon's Kotoan followers exulted in mindless acts of violence and tried to appeal to him so that he would aid them in the restoration of their empire. I mean, there's a lot that you can do with that. I mean, the concept oh. that you could take a tribe of Kuatoa, convince them that Jack the Ripper is a deity, and then next thing uh-huh. you know, <laughs> Jack's going on a killing spree. Yeah, there's a fucking demon <laughs> with like, Wolverine claws going ham in the town. Wow. <laughs> what the Getting hell? Some, some player antics there and get the get the Kuatoa to worship your party, and then yeah. suddenly, you're, suddenly you're a pantheon. Suddenly, your dreams are being haunted by Kuatoan songs. Like, <laughs> oh I, man! I always like to imagine that if I had a a bunch of players that would try to do something like that, it would go awry in the sense that the Kuatoa would like, although they would see them, they would create their own interpretation Image, of I them. Guess. So you end up with like a, these uh, these completely evil, fucked up uh, eldritch duplicates of the right. party. You end up with like, what are they called? Like the, the you know how DC has like <laughs> the opposite Superman. <laughs> oh, you mean like Bizarro. Bizarro, yeah. yeah. I know it, it makes me <laughs> think of the, white clothes of themselves. <laughs> I, I just uh, my mind instantly goes to that episode of Power Rangers where uh, they had to fight the Psycho Rangers. You know, yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> you got the Water Temple too. You got the uh, mm-hmm. Legend of Zelda. I think that was the Water Temple with Shadow Link. Same same idea. Mm. All right. And then when you get into the ones that, you know, worship like Dagon and stuff like that, they believe themselves to be the primal race, you know. <laughs> I don't know if they mean, they mean the primal race of Kuatoa or, you know, they were the first first. And they believe that Dagon would one day return to flood the land of the surface worlders. They would also spread his faith to humanoids, small bands of their cult infiltrating desperate and ignorant coastal towns. Allegiance was rewarded with gold and fine fishing, and resistance punished with genocidal raids. <laughs> with genocidal rage. <laughs> raids. Yeah, they're, they're raiding villages. <laughs> uh, that's Ingsmith right there. Yeah. Yeah. So we can go ahead and get into their abilities and stats here. Um, Their stats aren't that impressive, you know, but it is power of the tribe, you know? <laughs> We got a strength of 13, dexterity of 10, constitution of 11, intelligence of 11, wisdom of 10, and charisma of 8. Hmm. Proficient with spears, nets, hooks, you know, the like. Okay, so, so they're like harp. They're about the same as a strong uh, fisherman. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty standard. You know, the psychic damage inflicted by the illithids rendered the Kuatoa mad but had another unintending side effect. In their insane state, the Kuatoa invented gods of their own to protect themselves from the threats they constantly faced. The subconscious <laughs> energy of belief of enough Kuatoa simultaneously was actually capable, causing the entity to manifest in reality. Everyone knows this. You know, we talk about Kuatoa all the time. This is their, like, iconic, their create entity, you know? It, it, it is their bread and butter and what they are known for. This subconscious power allowed the Kuatoa to drive, sorry, to draw power from their own belief in said entity, giving them access to a kind of divine power. The more powerful the gogglers believed, the greater their abilities. And with some individual priests being capable of causing supernatural events, two priests working in concert could achieve effects like creating blasts of lightning. A dangerous ability the Kuatoa possessed was the contagious nature of their madness. Possibly owing to their mental abilities or simply their weak wills, the initial break of Akuto's mind had a 10% chance of causing the gogglers around them to suffer from similar episodes. Even though madness contracted this way was confined to temporary breaks, and anyone but the first victim, this was still a very dangerous phenomenon. If not cold or detained quickly, the madness could swiftly infest the entire community, sending it spiraling into chaos. Interesting. 
Damn. Hmm? So it's dominoes with these things. Yeah. They're like, oh, look at Steve over there freaking the fuck out. <laughs> Get him out of here. <laughs> That's a whole lot of chaos. Like, I, I guess if a DM really just wants to have a field day fucking with their players, Kuotoa are kind of like the A team in that regard. They could really, like, they could be a nuisance to a, oh, God, there's a tribe of Kuotoa coming in. <laughs> like, and they brought some weird fucked up God. Like, <laughs> <the> <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, last but not least, get over their, like, little abilities here. Got amphibious, can breathe water and air, otherworldly perception. They can sense the presence of any creature within 30 feet of it that is invisible or on the ethereal plane. And can, like, perfect pinpoint, too, <laughs> whether you're moving or not. Advantage on, avi- advantage on ability checks and saving throw is made to escape a grapple. And sensitivity to sunlight. I'm translating as I... Disadvantage on perception checks in the daylight. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. That's that's about it for Kuatoa, you know. I don't want to go too crazy, you know, but I mean it, when it comes to Kuatoa, they they're pretty self explanatory where the this DMing style is go crazy. <laughs> yeah. This is truly like your imagination. Like, they could have seen a bird one day and be like, oh, I wish I had wings. And everybody would be like, oh, me too. And then suddenly there's a Kuatoa with fucking griffin wings going off. Like, <laughs> hey, that's, a, that's a good adventure hook right there. You gotta, you can you can get the party pretty well with that. You're like, um, this tribe is sending random creatures at this village. <laughs> I think the fun thing is, uh, I don't know where I read it. It might have been like a 3-5 book or something. But I remember reading a thing about Kuatoa years ago where uh, it their god creations start out small and progressively... Mm-hmm. Through the power get, of belief, yeah. Yeah, through the power of belief, they get bigger and bigger. And as they do, their CR slowly escalates. <laughs> and it, it, even in some cases, like, say they create a you know small level being... They give it a test. You're like, you know, go infiltrate this village, cause some damage. Maybe it goes off and they're like, oh my God, it's amazing. Suddenly it jumps up 10 CRs. <laughs> that was a threat. And that's one of the things you could, uh, you could put that in your game as like a sort of plot hook early on, like level, level two, level three guys and be like, yeah, there's some weird stuff going on in the fishing village. They completely blow it off and go, uh, right. Yeah. Cause down, so down, down blow market, it off. Uh, market yeah. deals. A couple levels levels later, it's like, oh, another another fishing village. Something weird's going on. The whole the whole coast is uh, mm-hmm. going dark here. I don't know what's going on. And then like just so, slowly ramp it up there as right. the uh, as the game goes on. And like you can really imagine like they're left alone for a while and they're just like allowed to make things. They could get out of control quickly. Oh yeah, it it seems like they could definitely snowball. And I think that as a DM, that might be the best way to handle it. I mean, create rumors of things happening. Just keep them small. Maybe the players just gloss over it. Maybe things are so right. insignificant that they just ignore things. Maybe some other hunters killed a weird creature the other week. You know, they didn't think anything of it. Now there's another one, you know. Oh, odd. Whatever. Weird creatures all the time. Yeah. Like, have it grow in the background. And if you do things in the right way, I suppose it could be an overarching thing where they do create the big bad for your campaign. Yeah. Because, you know, players often forget that, like, yeah, they're doing stuff in the world, but the world exists around you. NPCs are probably going to talk about you. Creatures and monsters are going to hear of you. The Kuatoa here, like we were just talking about this, the Bizarro, you know, they hear about some strong warriors going around fighting <laughs> dragons. <laughs> All they need is a vague description. <laughs> oh, yeah. This skeletal a- angel man swooped down and uh, he slaughtered all these bandits and saved my baby. And then he summoned a snake out of nowhere. And it was like on, on his arm. And they're like, whoa. A man, an a, a death angel <laughs> man swooped in, killed an entire city, mm-hmm. and, and he has snakes for arms. Holy you ever shit! Telephone. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
what was That's just a so guy <laughs> is now a walking dragon. <laughs> I, I like that. Oh, it, it's a oh. great concept. So, in the style as we normally do, Orion, you think you could take a cool to it? I straight up one v one. You know what? They got the same stats as a typical human. I could totally take a Kuotoa in a fight. They're pretty short. They got a bite attack. Maybe whatever. Oh yeah, the little nippy yeah. nippy. Hey, they could be mostly teeth. I imagine that that head's got to be pretty big. I think I could yeah. take a fingerling. I'll take one of the little ones. When <laughs> how how would you fight a fingerling? <laughs> like about deep three feet tall, deep fry. <laughs> <laughs> Let this man cook. <laughs> Punt him. <laughs> oh, no. uh, Futurama, they had something like that where they're eating all the they're deep frying the uh, oh the poplars. <laughs> You know, the babies. Start deep frying them and just export them. And then oh, boom, suddenly your, your campaign just went off the rails. Yep. Suddenly you sell, you know, a cart full of Kuatoa bodies to a fisher village. And there you, know, you go. I mean, if it weren't for their uh, strength, I would just think that uh, <laughs> it'd be no different than how many, uh, how many fifth graders can you take in a fight? You know what I mean? I mean, basically, yeah, they're not probably about as smart. <laughs> oh, that, but then, that, you know, until that. you start dealing with the, you know, the, the better versions, you know, the gopplers or whatever, I'm not too impressed by a normal Kuotoa. But until, you know, get to the ones that start doing magic and get strong, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd know. imagine I could, uh, yeah, I could go for some shenanigans, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, "I'm cool. Check this out." <laughs> yeah, well, well, they're busy creating a god because I just uh, went and removed my thumb. Yeah, Ooh. exactly. Exact. <laughs> Never see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> now, hold up! I know you want to kill me. Check this out. Another worldly kind of magic. <laughs> Uh, no spells or anything. No components. <laughs> Some kind of innate magic. <laughs> he doesn't even have a wand. Oh, man. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed the Kuotoa discussion. I think uh, I'm probably grossly underestimating Kuotoa. I'd give them a 3 uh, out of 10 if in a fight if if it's just one. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, thing. Yeah. Probably never going to get just one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many Kuto do you think you've taken? <laughs> I don't know. I have a lot of unresolved anger issues. <laughs> like, give me like three. <laughs> I don't know. If I got a good weapon going for me at the start of this fight, I, I might do pretty well. Uh, if yeah. I got my bow, okay, I can probably uh, take out three of them. If I got a sword, then, uh, you know, probably more. Kuotoas can be outfitted for any party level, really. Give them, you know, trashy spears for level one, you know. They got netted hooks for level fives, you know. They got they magic. how to fish. They can, they can just yeah. do all kinds of stuff. Right. I would imagine nets would be like their big tactic. Just yeah. net everything. And they have that those I like the, the poles with like the hooks on them. I don't know what they're called. Hmm. Oh. Oh, is that the gaff hooks? That's the one they got for, yeah. for fishing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I watched. Uh, what was it deadliest catch? I'm an expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen deadliest catch? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the <laughs> the poet, the deadliest catch guys. They're up there. They're up there imagining their own deeds. They could take many Kuto on. Oh yeah. Now that's they a movie do. worth seeing, actually. They probably do. I would imagine people who live in like oil rigs and shit, they're like ringing the bells. They're like, oh, the Kuotoa return. Kuotoa bell, they're yeah. Like, they climb got, in the chip. <laughs> got an old tiny <laughs> church on top of the oil rig, and they run up there and they're ringing the bell. The I, Kuotoa. I like the sound of that. D&D 2 Kuotoa Boogaloo. I, I, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> Uh, if D and D is so cool, where's D and D too? 
I think one of the, the actors was like, hey, dude, I'm not saying that there's going to be a D&D 2, but there's probably going to be a D&D 2. I probably will. I mean, they, they did a little better than Breaking Even, so I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah I mean, they, they did pretty decent considering people were protesting their movie actively. <laughs> <laughs> True. Like people if, protest if, everything, though. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Honestly, nowadays, protests are, it's kind of like uh, being French. If you're not having a revolt in your country as, and you're French, you're, you're not, if you're, you're not French. It, you you got to have a, re a revolution every few years. Viva la revolution. Uh, always. <laughs> Sometimes the revolution should have coup attila involved. Hey, so maybe they would succeed. <laughs> I'm just imagining a bunch of uh, working class Kuatoa with these oh uh, safety vests and hard hats. Like, this is another scenario because, like, Kuatoas are often slaves, right? They're a slave race to a lot of other races. Kuatoa in prison break would go crazy. <laughs> I, 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 if you got if you got the uh, character sheets for Kuatoa, I think if you got the template for players to roll up Kuatoa, you could you could get some good one shots out of that. I don't know about a full campaign, but you get a Kuatoa one shot, and you get a persuasive party. You get like an eloquence party or something in there, and then suddenly you're you're creating your own religion in this one shot. Just going going Kuatoa village to Kuatoa village. <laughs> you know how they have like the like the rat kings and stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> Hang I, up and I see love it. Uh, this is the one shot we need because, like you said, uh, for a one shot, this is fantastic. For a campaign, it's going to break within five sessions. It falls apart <laughs> almost immediately, but damn if it's not a blaze of glory. <laughs> now you have like the countries of the world bending together to combat these Kuato. <laughs> I mean, you do like a you do like a time jump one shot where it's like, okay, you start at level one, play a second session at level ten, and then you're level twenty Kuatoa who have the whole <laughs> Kuatoa nation at your back. Oh you're, man, you're taking down empires. That's a that's a ten years. I've trained my people. <laughs> your level ups just skip entire brain. levels. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea of that because, like, that's an advanced milestone system that would work for them. That would be crazy. Like, boom! You've you've Kuatoa'd your first city. You're you're level fifteen now. So I would love to play a campaign from the perspective of like the enemy. You know? Oh, absolutely! Like. I think so a lot of people probably did that in the early days of D&D, &D, where it's just like, you couldn't normally play as the monsters. Like, my dad and his buddies, they would be like, okay, let's homebrew a thing up, and we can play kobolds or play as goblins. Yeah, we'll have to work things around and make our own uh, thing and whatever. And, I mean, yeah. I think the way you got to do it is this, this takes a whole bunch of uh, DM prep work and, like, <laughs> real dedication to it but you've got to start it off as like a, okay i'm not really describing you guys that you're the monsters you're not the bad guys but like just describe the world as like we're the only civilization left and play it like a reverse sort of zombie thing mm -hmm. and then like there's these huge <laughs> concentrations of the bad guys and then like halfway through the campaign it's like the light bulb moment and they're like oh shit the bad guys are just humans like those are cities mm. and like you're playing the little guy who's just trying to like survive escaping these guys right you, got to <laughs> you describe humans as just these these massive uh grotesque skin flesh creatures with with <laughs> gangly <God>. hair <laughs> in the forest you live in not slimy at all they live completely Making... out of water they're monsters <laughs> i love it let someone make a campaign like this. I I'm down. <laughs> I mean, the, the Lovecraft stuff. You got you got campaigns for days. All of Cthulhu is a good one. I'm going to run that one so bad someday. Uh, one day. I I've been wanting to. But it's just... Oh, man. Uh, I can you know. probably do it on Foundry. Actually, yeah, you there... absolutely can. Uh, there is uh, some uh, modules for that. I was looking into it. I know there is the, you know, the Candela Obscura stuff is kind of, you know, from the same kind of vibe. I'm thinking about that. That's possible. Maybe in the future, run a more uh, investigative kind of campaign. Well, that could be fun. I I'd like to see that. 
Mm. I would probably do a Call of Cthulhu personally, but yeah. All right. So, Sam, I did bring in a Describeify this week. I, I know it's been a few oh, weeks. Nice, nice. I, I, and I feel like it, it's a uh, it's a small word that you don't hear often. Some people don't even know what it actually means. I didn't until today. And That's the point. It zounds. Excuse <laughs> me? Yeah, this, this <laughs> zounds. It, it's, it's such a dumb word, but, like, I feel like it adequately describes the fuckery reaction that a uh, a fisherman might have to like dealing with all this uh sounds like, a, like a jet shit. E term. <laughs> well it sounds man so <laughs> yeah. holy sounds yeah. what does this mean <laughs> it, it's the, a way of expressing surprise indignation or anger it's like oh, oh, zounds. <laughs> oh okay. you. The comic book speech bubble zone yeah exactly. yeah I, I used to see it all the time as a kid but it's like i've never heard someone it's actively like a, use it so i feel like, like a regional like dialect thing it, it very well might be it, it's a uh, there, there's really not much to it outside of it just being a just this weird little it, sound of surprise. Like, country of origin. <laughs> it's definitely English. I don't know. There's a there's a Z in there. It might be uh might be German. Mm, may, maybe. But it, well, it, it's weird because like I look for uh, some of the stuff on the Google, and it's giving me stuff for the band sounds, which is a a band right out of the uk i'm like okay well that that kind of skews any definitions i'm getting out beyond that <laughs> but i feel like it'd be a fun way to kind of spice up certain characters that you have meet a party just like if you want to make a character sound a little different little and like something to stick out to a party like just just throw out a weird word like zounds Oh no, who dropped? Ah, there we go. I feel like I have to sneeze. Oh, sorry about that. Ah, that was strange. Yeah, I went and looked it up. I don't know if you heard me. Uh, you used the Mao Oath. 1592, huh? Yeah, it's it's an old word. <laughs> Came over with the Kuatoa. Archaic interjection have. uses a mount oath to express surprise, indignation, or disbelief. It is a variant of swoons, which means God's wounds. Oh, okay. Really? That's. <laughs> oh, here we go. Zounds are an English anarcho punk post band from Reading, Berkshire. Is that <laughs> Zounds band? Formed in 1977. <laughs> anarcho punk sounds. <laughs> That sounds wild. Dude, releasing material on the Fuck Off Records label. We're also involved in the squatting and free festival scene. Interesting. <laughs> uh, that's just... I, I don't even know where to begin on that. Ah. There's also a Zound Hearing chair in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, there is everything in New Jersey. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. what is it, like a like a hearing place, a bit like a hearing aid. Shout yeah. out to Zound Hearing. You know, if anyone needs hearing aids or <laughs> yes, yeah, Zound Hearing. If you want to sponsor the show, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wouldn't that be something? <laughs> uh, you know, we we can't get Zounds Hearing, but we have the next best thing for a sponsor, uh, Sam. News. <laughs> was, that, was that a wrong answer <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear anything <laughs> I don't know if you played a, a sound or anything <laughs> <laughs> Still hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> that line gets me every time. <laughs> I'm so confused. 
<laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope the listeners can at least hear whatever sound you're playing. <laughs> oh, what? Really? You you couldn't hear that? Yeah. Oh, no. no, we didn't get it. Yeah, no. We, oh. Yeah. I I was enjoying myself. I was. Thinking That's why I was, I was deeply confused. <laughs> oh well, you know what? <laughs> Fuck. I, I. You know what? Now now I look like a fucking idiot. Can you at least Got hear him? Can, can can you hear this? Nope. I didn't even hear the intro for today's episode, man. Did Did you hear that one? I didn't. Nope. Oh, what? The I Kua Toa are conspiring against us. We, uh, we laid the seeds like of madness me. into his brain. Hmm. I I am just. I am just confused. While he's doing that, are you familiar with the Game Awards that went on this past few days? I know Baldur's Gate cleaned up. I oh, yeah, it. dude. Shout out to Baldur's Gate and all the awards and accolades they got. I didn't watch it, but I did, you know, check out the uh, some of the highlights and stuff like that. I had a few things. Some, the time, uh, time. some headlines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, Baldur's Gate, Marvel, Spider-Man got Game of the Year. Uh, let's see what else here. Spider-Man, Baldur's Gate got Best Game Direction. Also Zelda, but, you know, I don't really care about that. We got uh, you know, The Last of Us, Gran Turismo, Castlevania got Best Adaptation. Baldur's Gate, Final Fantasy, Cyberpunk, and Spider-Man got best narrative. You know, all okay. kinds of stuff. Yo, shout out to Lies of P with the best art direction. Hell yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Sam, I figured out what it was. Oh, yeah? Ah. This is TNF, bringing you nerd news. There. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, shout out to all those things, and if you guys... <laughs> You know, watched it last night. I don't know if it was last night or the day before, but you know, if you guys watched it, there was a lot of cool stuff that they showed and revealed. Like the new Monster Hunter, I'm kind of hyped for that. There's a lot of stuff yeah. being uh, shown <laughs> off at the end of the year, right yeah. here. The, the God of War Valhalla stuff. We got OD with the Jordan Peele game, Blade. It's uh, gonna be a crazy year, 2024. Uh, dude, also, I, <laughs> I heard about the Blade thing, and then the, like I saw a little yeah. bit of the trailer where they open up with like a barber, like trying not to mess oh, up his fade. I'm just like, all right, look, dude. That's the first thing you gotta get it right. All right. But look, I don't know if you saw the the video from the voice of Kratos, the God of War guy, talking about the uh, the Call of Duty. <laughs> he was throwing shade, and it was hilarious. I mean, how else do you get attention in this day oh, and age? Man. It was pretty. We, good. we need to, to start throwing shade if we want to. You know, <laughs> we're too damn nice, Sam. We got to stop being nice. Are right, you know what? Table top Tom <laughs> got some beef with you. <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, tell every guest that the, you know, your your mom smells bad and you, you, she dresses you funny. Yeah, that being stinky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, shout out to all that stuff. I thought that was really cool. You know, good to see you know some new games, some new stuff. You know. Well, speaking of some new stuff, uh, there is uh, some news that we read over here on Dicebreaker. So mm. they had a release date for the uh, D&D books for 2024, and uh, they, they announced it and everything. And then they're like, oh, oh shit, we, we got it all wrong. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Rip. What? See, eh. slipping in, <laughs> slipping in another fail before the year ends. <laughs> It's been a wild year for them. Well, they're trying their best. <laughs> I I feel like this kind this kind of fuckery could only be caused by the unadulterated pressure of a nagging Hasbro. It's got to be something like that. Because like Watsy, you know they they were doing fine for a while for years, you know like. And, and Christmas just... is a is a difficult time for all companies. I mean, they're, are they expecting a bunch of new DMs in Christmas time? Like, what what you want, Hasbro? Probably. I mean, they hope at least. 
<laughs> I mean, all over Reddit, I always see people like uh, post uh, things where it's just a, a big old stack of starter sets and like, I'm donating this to the toy drive. Yeah, uh, I, I, I certainly hope those kids can read. <laughs> May just be uh, Watsy donating those themselves and posting. Oh, them. they're flooding the market. Yeah. Oh, that's that's brilliant. Hooking them <laughs> that, in. That's some marketing. Uh, aside from that, uh, when twenty twenty four books are released for Watsy, we mm-hmm. can expect a uh, one of them to include a face off with Vecna. So, nice. haven't seen any Vecna stuff from Wizards in years. It's been like. Vecna is like one of the most legendary liches in the game. Didn't they do something recently oh, for the, the Stranger Things stuff? Yeah. Yeah, but that might be the only reason they're bringing Vecna back. I mean, yeah, probably. Because hey, trying to rehash the important. If you can get if you can get more people to say, what the hell, if you can Google get people to Google Vecna, then boom, you're right at D and D. I mean, like, Stranger Things already brought you know so much stuff that they're just kind of trying to keep it going. People are losing interest in Stranger Things, even the actors and stuff, you know. Well, yeah, they're only good for one more season. Terrible. Yeah, bro. They, they're like, look, we've been doing this show for 10 years. We want to move on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I totally get it. It's just one of those things Netflix where... Is the, oh, the, uh, last couple seasons, a little weird. I, I enjoyed it because the last season brought us Eddie. And like, dude... <laughs> Eddie, Eddie is the shirt. epitome. Did, uh, merchandise off that one. For Eddie. Oh, for sure. For, uh, what is it? Uh, who's the who sings that song? Uh, Kate. Kate Hill. No, what the what the hell's the name? Running up that hill. Uh, Kate. Oh. Uh, yes, yeah, so th- that one got big. Yeah. Uh, the, the real gem to come out of that whole season, though, was uh, that final stand with eddie uh playing uh just shredding on guitar it, it was it, so good it, it's just like dude you're in another world it's basically a hellscape he was like ha- i'm gonna die i'm going down like this <laughs> man single-handedly secured one of the uh, top five deaths in human history right Straight there up. Oh my god, iconic. No, he's, he's coming back next season. The next masculine season. urge to go out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> it, that really, it really does It'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, They're really hoping to cash in on the Vecna thing. And, you know, I, I, yeah. oh, OBS says it disconnected and reconnected. Uh, okay, reconnection successful. Ah. Hey guys, I uh, I hate to uh, to jump midstream, but um, I gotta I gotta hit the road. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me today. And I mean, hey, yeah, yeah. If you're looking for a tabletop? Uh, give us a call. Of course, thanks absolutely. For coming. Great to have I, you. Thanks for coming on. And you know what? I'm gonna be spreading the word on that VTT. We mm-hmm. already got links in the description, so plug in that. And you're welcome to come back anytime if. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, check out check out the sandbox. You can go right in there. Uh, drop some tokens, drop some maps, uh, yeah. play a game. If it's not easier, you can uh, you can call me back and tell me I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now we that's a slogan. I love it. If it's not <laughs> easier, call us. We'll make it easy. Oh yeah. All right, you guys take care. Thanks for coming. It was great to have you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. <laughs> Not too bad. We're coming up towards the end here anyway. Oh, no. I I went and I screwed up our thing. (laughs) Did you? Yeah. It's because uh, when he left the call, it just uh, it messed with the thing. But that's okay. I can fix Uh, that. uh, All right. Yeah, I believe we are coming up towards the end anyway. If you're finished with the news, we can go ahead and move into our homebrew. Yeah, let me just uh, fix that. Who and fix yours. <laughs> it's not often that we have someone uh, leave uh, early, but it's okay. It happens. Yeah. All good. What a great guest. I, I love that he's working on uh, this whole VTT because, like, we really need more of those out there. Honestly. All right, Sam, do you, you want to start the uh, homebrew off or should I? Sure, I'll go ahead. Generic realm, generic realm, lots of fun, excellent. Uh, 
it's always fun in the generic realm. Generic realms. Shout out to the Fluffy Folio on uh, Reddit here for creating the bookworm, the tiny monstrosity that I will be talking about today. <laughs> oh, yeah. I believe I've uh, talked about some things from the Fluffy Folio before. Uh, you um, have? Let me just uh, readjust some of this because, like, there we go. Yeah. Let's get the problem. Problem. picture. There. Good. I think it's really cool. I really like it. <laughs> it's so cute. So this peculiar critter is the smallest yet most cunning representative of the highly venomous worm genus. With its remarkable ability to perfect, perfectly imitate a tube of paper, it secretly roams wherever books are present, from the dust ridden library of an ancient civilization to the buzzing bookshop selling heavy tomes and fantastic scrolls. Being able to remain motionless over extended periods of time, it is not uncommon for this whimsical creature to be utilized for a hasty note, a secret message, or a cheesy poem of love, completely unnoticed by the unwary author. <laughs> that is something else. Yeah, I like it. And they do have a little ability here called Living Scripts. Bookworms can live up to several centuries. The oldest ones are often covered in countless hieroglyphs, but potentially bearing the knowledge from long forgotten times. Now, they are a fairly simple creature here. That's uh, cool. We have a strength of 1, dexterity of 18, constitution of 10, intelligence of 5, wisdom of 18, and charisma of 4. Uh, with the ability to understand one language, but being unable to speak. So I wonder if you could probably speak telepathically. Or give it commands and stuff like that. Well, they're, they're wise I'd, and intelligent, I would imagine. Yeah. So we have these special traits here. Marked for death. As long as a creature has at least one poison mark, it is poison and must make a DC 13 constitution saving throw each hour. Taking 5, 2d4 poison damage on a failed save. Half as much damage on a success. Also, on a success, target loses one poison mark. Poison mark can be removed by the protection from poison spell or similar magic. A creature with 6 or more poison marks falls prone at the end of each of its turns. Okay, that's hmm. pretty cool. That is, Next I like that. Paper Shaper. <laughs> as a bonus action, the bookworm can fold or unfold its body. While the bookworm is folded and remains motionless, it is indistinguishable from our normal sheet of paper. All right, cool. And then last but not least, we have a normal attack action, dealing the poison damage and applying one of the poison marks. Hmm. I like it. No poisons. Little uh, paper snake. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That's cute. And this is something that uh, could be kind of like a fun, you know, maybe your players go to a shop, they buy some scrolls. Oh, one of them is alive. <laughs> Honestly, it's one of those uh, things that turns into a mundane encounter. And sometimes just mundane shenanigans can make a game, you know? Right. Or, you know, who knows? Maybe somebody's like, oh, you know, don't kill this. It's kind of cool. But maybe they have like a shopkeep that has an infestation. Oh, God. The party has to come and get rid of them. Or figure yeah. out which ones are which. Oh, yeah, you got to get out, get the exterminators. All right, because shopkeeper can't tell. <laughs> yeah, These he finds one. Adorable. He has to assume there's more. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're breeding. Ah, they're slowly replacing all of his books. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're taking over the history section. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You could even have like personalities. Based on like what kind of book or whatever they are, <laughs> I, could, I could like that. Dude, stay away from the ones that read in the political section. Oh my god, the nonfiction <laughs> ones. Crazy. <laughs> Not uh, the erotica books. <laughs> <laughs> Not the hentai. Oh no, what's it called? The lusty Argonian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the lusty Argonian me. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, this. I give it, a, I give it an eight, just kind of like a for fun little thing. <laughs> Easy do, way to create a new pet or companion. I do enjoy <laughs> fun little things, and in, in the spirit of fun little things, I present to you, ah, pets and animals leveling rules. Ooh, is this uh, similar to the one in like Stibbles? Uh, very much so. Uh, this nice. is actually like a. 
Let me see here. Yeah, this is from Johnny DM. And mm. as you can see on the little uh, leveling table, there's like 10 levels, so nothing too much. And this can be applied to any pet that the party gets, right? Okay. So, uh, and the XP goes up to 4,000. And in okay. order to get XP for your pet, there's actually an alternative way of leveling. Oh. Which is explained in the PDF. And anyone that uh, really wants to uh, check this out or apply it to their campaign over on... Uh, let me look at my... See if I can oh, so for something the... like a like a rogue's companion, yeah, drive through mm -hmm. DM, yeah. Uh, so like it's over on drive through DM, uh, yeah, the drive through RPG for mm -hmm. uh, three seventy five. So pretty cheap if anyone wants to check that out. But you're, you're able to like every time it levels up, more HP you can get a special uh, pet special feat a bonus to their skills or attacks or damage rolls or to their AC or saving throws at like every level your pet gets sub better, like tangibly better and more survivable with its stats, which is one of the biggest issues with having pets in D and D. Mm -hmm. I don't want my pet to die. You know, Yeah, you don't want them to be too strong, but you want them to keep up with your party. Right? Exactly. Retain their usefulness is the hardest way to manage. Now, the way this is built, it's very good for uh, downtime activities. Uh, mm. Right here, where it says pet activities, we have playtime, feeding and meal prep, cuddle and affection, oh, yeah. outdoor exploration. Now, uh, some of these things are like, you know, players are going to be RPing this stuff anyway if they really like the pet. Uh, right. Others are like weekly activities that could uh, come into play just by simply adventuring. So regardless of what you're doing, you're going to be leveling up this thing mm -hmm. pretty quickly. And I can imagine, you know, for the more, I mean, even without them being like combat pets, you know, even the ones that have some type of utility to the party, I could see that aiding towards their leveling as well. Yeah. Like a, an outdoor adventure would be one of the weekly activities, for example, which will get you 20 XP. Mm. Take your pet on an outdoor adventure, explore new environments, enjoy nature. Right. Uh, Yoga or stretching for 30 minutes can get you 10 <laughs> XP. Learning new tricks can get you 15 XP. Uh, an evening stroll, 5 XP. Interacting and feeding, 5 XP. Nature observation. Mindful meditation. <laughs> story time with the pet. You could tell your dog a story and it gets it. XP to level up. Yeah, I mean, I would entice people to, uh, you know, just role play more in general, too. Yeah. You tell a story to your party while they're sitting down for a long rest. Boom. There you go. Yeah. I mean, you get two daily bonding activities to get some XP and one weekly bonding activity up to two uh, right. per week. So theoretically, let's say uh, you're going on a typical seven day week. You could uh, get about 10 to 15 XP daily in addition to the uh, 10 to 15 that you can get for two weekly active. I mean, uh, more like a 20 to 30 XP you can get for weekly activities. Mm -hmm. So already you, you'll level up in to your first level within a week. Yeah. So if you keep that up on a weekly basis, you'll be within two weeks, you're level two. Two and a half weeks, you'll be level three. And right. a few more weeks, you know, like after that, uh, you'll probably get around level four. And it does climb higher and higher uh, as you level up, but that's to be expected. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that these, this is factoring in, you know, combat XP as well. You know. Well, actually, no, this is completely separate oh. from combat XP. Oh, completely separate, okay. Yeah, because uh, it caps out at 4K XP. Mm-hmm. And like, like I said, within a week, you can easily reach the level one uh, preset, which is just like, OK, mm -hmm. you start with a pet. It's level zero. Theoretically, mm -hmm. you need love and affection for it to get these special pet feats and stuff. Right. 
I mean, what I would also want to, uh, I mean, me, maybe me personally, like, if it survives its first fight, give it the combat XP, you know what I mean? Or if it does something significant during the fight, give it a little bit of a cut. Well, I think that's where some of the adventuring and stuff comes in. But that's there's, also, there's also monthly special activities, which uh, mm. up to two of those can give you 100 XP. Okay. So nice. within a month, you can, in game, in a month, Let's see, that's 200 plus the, about 600. So, yeah, you could get about 1,000 XP uh, within six weeks. Yeah, that's not too bad. And 1,000 XP gets you to level six. Okay, yeah. So I think that's reasonably balanced. And a lot of these things are just simple RP or you're just casually doing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine, you know, you're probably getting maybe two to three levels on your pet for every player level or so. Yeah. And not every pet is combat based, so this can be yeah. pretty good. Definitely. And like the outdoor adventure right here. Uh, have an extensive outdoor adventure day, exploring new terrain, providing for your pet with a thrilling experience. Adventurers are in, are inherently out there doing shit. So like mm -hmm. some of this XP is just passive. Yeah. All right. You go hunt down a goblin nest, boom, you're adventuring with your pet. <laughs> exactly. But uh, that's a uh, like mine for the week. Oh, I keep trying to do this thing that there. Yeah, I I like it. I feel like something or I feel like pets are something that are very underutilized so like when stables came out you know that called out to me and i was like oh i gotta get this book this is so cool for sure i i like it i, I, I love I, companions i love pets yeah uh just so everyone knows what i was doing earlier when i was uh going all schizo with my soundboard oh, yeah. here you were being a weirdo yeah <laughs> listen up you miserable lot if you're looking for a tavern that'll put hair on your chest, then get your sorry hides over to Riker's Ale House, the meanest, <laughs> toughest, and rowdiest joint this side of the mountain. Who am I, you ask? I'm Riker, the Orc <laughs> of Thunder, the Bruiser of Brews, the Conqueror of Kegs, and this is my house of mayhem. We've got ale. We've got it in barrels. If you ain't had our ale, you ain't tasted the true nectar of the gods. It'll make mm. you roar louder than any dragon and hit harder than a hill giant. Hungry? We've got meat on the bone. Juicy, tender, and cooked over an open flame. If it doesn't make your tusk tingle, it's not worth eating. We've got brawls. We've got <laughs> arm wrestling. We've got tales of glory and gore. The best fights and stories happen here at Rikers. Challenge me, Riker, if you dare. But be warned, I don't hold back. Orcs, dwarves, humans, and elves. We don't discriminate here. If you've got a thirst for adventure and a stomach for a hearty meal, Riker's Ale House is your battlefield. The walls echo with tales of the mighty and the fallen. Every War Chief's Day, we've got a special on our famous Orcs Blood Brew. A concoction so strong, it'll put hair on your warts. So grab your axes, your mugs, and your battle cries, <laughs> and come to Riker's Ale House, where the ale flows like a waterfall, and the fights are fiercer than dragon's breath. Riker's Ale House for the true warriors among us. Be there or be a goblin snack. <laughs> that sounds cool. I want to go. Hold on. I'm going to Riker's, man. Yeah. That's probably where we go uh, after the start of the show tonight. <laughs> we'll grab a drink, come on. Dude, if it don't make your tusk tingle. Oof. Man, I don't know. Meat on the bone, right there. That line gets me every time. Yeah, I, I heard Riker got the the siren bar mates. Oof. Oh mm, yeah, the sexy ones. Like it, even the fat siren bar mates are all right. <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> this episode and that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, 
we can't mm. always control our sponsors, but you know, when 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 they got the coin, take what you can get, man. Honestly, shout out <laughs> to Ricky. Thank you for the <laughs> <laughs> all all the support. You know that that's how I got uh, this right here. This whole little Stein exactly. here. Exactly. Oh man, do we have anything else for today's episode? Honestly, it's uh, been a uh, pretty small episode, I I would say. Yeah, pretty light week. I mean, with the exception of like the game rewards and stuff like that, you know. Ah, GTA 6, I believe, got announced. I don't care personally, but cool. Two years for that. My wife is uh, hyped for that. She loves GTA. And the fact that she can play the game as a sassy Latina bitch, like she's down for that. (laughs) I'm, I'm gonna walk yeah, into the. People, I'm gonna walk into the room. My wife's gonna be swearing in Spanish at the goddamn TV. The camera's gonna be zoomed in as close as possible, just on her ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's what they need to revitalize the GTA. I mean, flip the script. What's better than uh, uh, beating uh, up your prostitute that you just paid for uh, some shady business in GTA? Running over everybody on a beat. Exactly. Exactly. That's where they lose me because the missions will be like, ah, oh, this one's like a die hard movie. And it's like, excuse me, I like blew up 18 bridges and like <laughs> ran over everybody on the beat just to get here. <laughs> Why yeah, is this mission any different? <laughs> I could go <laughs> rob a bank in 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll just crash Honestly. my car into the front of it. <laughs> it's like, uh, honestly, they they get too deep into their own RP yeah. with their story. They're like, dude, yeah. it, it's a play, it's Hayes a murder simulator. Andreas, <laughs> my young mind was yet to be tainted by the throes of mindless violence. <laughs> Speaking of mindless violence, Sam, I don't know if I mentioned it on the show previously, but I'm going to be producing a audiobook which we will be oh, doing yeah. a giveaway on the show soon. Well, oh, which come, one is it this uh, uh, come May or so, when after it uh, fully releases, I'll be able to uh, give away some uh, promo codes because as a producer, mm-hmm. I will get a bunch of free promo codes. So we'll mm-hmm. do a giveaway right here on the show. Now, nice. the name of the book is Vampocalypse. A, mm. Yeah. I told you about it before. It's a yeah, vampire okay. apocalypse, post-apocalyptic, but instead of zombies taking over, it's vampires. That's always like a like a what's it called? Dusk till dawn. What is that movie called? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I some people have told me that they they've heard of something similar to this before. I I, I maybe I have, but I really liked reading the uh, main character's voice because like. It's supposed to be a world where the sun's kind of uh, blocked out. Everything's mm. like dry and desolate. So he's got like kind of like a gravelly sandiness to his voice where it's just like, nice. Ugh, get, get this man some water. I mean, I feel like I had some, uh, some of my new favorite books come out recently. Uh, what was it called? The, uh, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> There's the, uh, the Primal Hunter series just came out with their most recent one. You have the uh, how to he he who fights with monsters came out with their new one soon recently. Hell Divers book eleven coming out soon. I'm excited. Nice, <laughs> so good. This is a good year for books. I'd say it's a fantastic year. I hope year. I can get into doing audiobooks as well. Maybe yeah, that's I, really I cool. highly encourage it. People love your voice. Uh, we we see that in the chat sometimes. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I made it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Maybe one day you guys will get a real voice reveal. <laughs> a voice reveal. Yeah, exactly. We'll never know. You don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Sam voice reveal. I, I am down for that. <laughs> but like you said, it have, it absolutely has been a great year for books. Uh, Kickstarters yeah. all over the place. And next week we're going to be having Felix from Dingo Doodles on the show. Uh, that's going to be a great episode. Hope you guys are looking forward to that. I am, uh, dude, I am excited to see Felix. Oh, yeah. I'm not too sure what we're going to talk about quite yet, but it's going to be something cool, I know. Dude, it, he is a cool DM. He's got that chaotic uh, DM energy, and I'm yeah. about it. 
Like uh, when Dingo started uh, posting her uh, little D and D stories, the first one she started with is like, "Oh yeah, the, that time that I cast an anti magic field and unleashed a Tarask from below a town." And it's just yeah, be like that, man. And Felix is just like ground zero DM dealing dealing with this shit and putting it in the game like a, a three point five child like myself. Okay, let, let's go. No. I'm tempted to talk about Hydras. Ooh. You know what? Hydras might be fun. Hydras might be fun. I know we've talked about the, you know, the outskirts of the dragon. We did dragon turtles, you know, purple dragons. I haven't talked about Hydras quite yet. Hmm. Before going into the, you know, the usual true dragon stuff. Maybe time. Yeah, you know what? And Felix said that he was looking forward to be a little surprised for the episode, so... Looking forward to that. It would be a piece to go off about Greek mythology. Honestly, <laughs> you know me in Greek mythology. I, uh, I, name's Orion. I got to know my Greek. Look, man, this is another reason for me to talk about Hades 2. Let's go. <laughs> Dude, Hades 2, Electric Boogaloo. But with that being said, uh, everybody have a great weekend. We are Dungeons and Talk Shows. And uh, Sam, where can everybody find us? Uh, you can find us on Twitter slash X, whatever it's called now. Find us on Facebook under the Nerd Militia. We're on Kick, Rumble, Tw- uh, YouTube, all all podcasts and apps, yeah. Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You know, we had a little bit of success with BitShoot too. Apparently, like uh, we got some we got some followers on there now. <laughs> Shout out to BitShoot. I've never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's always like that people that have never heard of youtube so they go to other places i guess that's true that's true we're just getting our fingies out there you know uh but anyway everyone have a great weekend hope you learned something i know i didn't <laughs> <laughs>